Good evening, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good morning to from people who are joining us from other parts of the world. Uh, a quick, a very short introduction to Dilini. Uh, Dilini is another classic case of uh, a loss to Sri Lanka and again to another country. Uh, Sri Lankan by birth, and she'd been living in Australia for the last eight years. Uh, she's an animal lover, photographer, travel enthusiast, and an investment banker. Currently living in Sydney, Australia with a husband and two dogs. She's always looking for an excuse to run to the jungles. Her love affair with nature and wildlife began when she was a little toddler, and she considered it as the greatest gift her dad uh, that she received from her dad. I'm sure most of our members do the same, pass on the interest and the passion to their next generation. Uh, being taken to parks in Sri Lanka from time she was, a, she was able to walk and inculcate in the love for nature and photography. Over the years, she has traveled extensively in Asia and Africa to photograph wildlife in their natural habitat. She, through a passion for nature, has created some outstanding photographs. Dilly hopes to showcase the beauty, complexity, sheer wonder of these animals in their natural habitat and in a small way inspire others to help the conservation effort. The recent highlight, of course, all of us are aware, is the, the photograph of the, the five cheetahs crossing the river that actually went global, uh, being uh, commended and very well uh, praised at the, the most prestigious photograph Wildlife Photography Awards run by the Natural History Museum of London. Uh, that extraordinary photograph of the cheetahs uh, taken at the Masai Mara Reserve uh, was something I think inspired a lot of our youngsters. Uh, that is something, uh, I mean, offline that we're, when you're discussing, even when you go to uh, uh, national parks, you see a lot of interest in a new breed of photographers who have taken up to wildlife photography. So I think our task today for Delini to share her inspiration to see how we can guide the new breed of photographers in the right direction uh, so that their passion and their interest in wildlife photography can be channeled towards the conservation of the very subject that they're out to photograph. Uh, over to you, Delini, to take us through your amazing work. Thanks very much, uh, Spencer, for that lovely introduction. Um, let me try and share my screen. And Fine. great. Yeah. Um, so, um, thanks everyone for joining uh, on this Thursday evening, and uh, thank you to uh, WP WNPS for inviting me to uh, basically share my love of. Um, nature and wildlife photography with you all. Um, as Spencer mentioned, um, I was born and raised in Sri Lanka. And uh, um, though I currently live in Sydney, um, my parents are still in Sri Lanka. So I have a very, and of course, all of my friends. So I still have a very close connection uh, with Sri Lanka. And um, so moving on, um, I think Spencer's kind of given a uh, introduction, but one of the questions that I always get asked is, you know, how did this uh, passion of mine develop? And it's all down to one man, and that is my father, who is on, who is listening in today. Um, so I've been visiting National Parks in Sri Lanka since I was a toddler. Um, he is a huge wildlife fan, and that has been passed on to me. Um, but I'm relatively new to photography. So I got my first DSLR 10 years ago. So I haven't been doing this for very long, um, but it has been a pretty amazing journey. Um, and um, so I've traveled a lot with my dad and right, currently um, I must admit that photography has become a family affair. Uh, both my husband, Banu and my dad shoot as well with my, um, Fair Canon cameras, so um, um, it's it's something that we as a family share, which is pretty amazing. And my mom is always willing to tag along um, and give her two cents as well. Uh, now moving on, um, 
this image, I think, is um, something you all must have seen. Um, and as Spencer mentioned, it was highly commended at the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards. And it also won the Wildlife Behavior Categories at the Nature Conservancy Awards, as well as the inaugural MCAPA Awards. Um, and I was just informed um, in the last week that it has also been shortlisted in the Australian Photography Awards. Um, I think a lot of people know the story behind this shot, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But this image is special to me for um, a few reasons. First of all, it is um, a very unique and once in a lifetime sighting. Um, it's not every day that you get to see the uh, sea fight sea grass crossing and uh, an overflowing river. Um, but this is more than a pretty picture to me. Um, to me, it shows the impact of human induced climate change. And I believe that some of the recognition that this image has received also came about because it is so relevant in today's environment. Um, with the, the COP15, um, the UN Conference for Biodiversity, as well as COP26, um, the UN Climate Change Conference, all taking place within the last um, six weeks. Um, climate change, um, as well as biodiversity loss, has been um, at the forefront of conversations these days. And the floods that these when we landed in the Mara in uh, January 2020, uh, there was it was unseasonal and torrential rain, and um, the elders, the Maasai elders, had never seen floods of this proportion. Um, so this is a reminder that human-induced climate change, if left unchecked, create another threat to these um, animals and, of course, uh, even to us humans. So I think this is a good segue um, into how wildlife uh, photography um, can help in conservation. And I think that's, at least to me, that's what wildlife photography is all about. Um, so wildlife photography is up in the right hands. It's a powerful tool for raising awareness. Um, not everyone is as lucky as you and me to be able to visit the jungles, to, be, to visit exotic locations and see these with their own eyes. But, you know, through our images, we can make people experience the wonders of the natural world. Um, we can give voice to those that don't have one. And um, we can encourage others to get involved in, their con in, in the conservation of these animals and their habitats. I think in, today, uh, in today's environment, being ethical and being responsible while we are engaging in wildlife photography is more important than ever. Um, you know, every single day we are losing biodiversity. Um, it was really disheartening to hear um, at the COP15 conference that none of the countries in the world had met their bio biodiversity targets. We keep losing species every single day. So I think it's important that as wildlife photographers, we make a pledge to ourselves that we be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem. If we go out there and if we um, act responsibly, if we cause um, you know, animals to change their behavior or cause habitat loss, then unfortunately um, we have become a part of that the, the wider issue. Um, so a mantra that I live by, maybe because I've I you know, became a photographer later in life, is that I am always a wildlife lover and a conservationist first and a photographer second. Um, and I think social media um, really makes creating awareness um, and, and creating awareness on conservation issues so much easier because of global reach. It doesn't cost very much. It's really easy to get a picture out there and create awareness. But unfortunately, it is also a double-edged sword. Um, it also encourages certain people to do things that they most probably normally wouldn't do to get the likes and the shares um, and the recognition that comes um, with having your images up on social media. Um, now, this image uh, by Marcia Cabral um, was um, won the animals in their environment category um, in, in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards in 2017. Um, unfortunately, a um, few months 
after the awards, um, he was disqualified. This image was disqualified and he was banned from entering the competition ever again because it came to light that, or at least um, there were allegations that the giant anteater in this picture was actually staged. Um, experts looked at it um, and the allegation was that the giant anteater was actually one from the park entrance. Um, so experts looked at it, they believed that there were enough similarities for that to be the case. And unfortunately, that's a lot of reputation damage that you can't undo. Um, another example, David Arrow, who is one of my favorite photographers, who's more fine art photographer than a wildlife photographer, um, did this shoot with a model in front of a super tusker that's Craig in the background. I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, and I guess you have to think, what, does, what message does this picture send? Are you encouraging all the Instagrammers out there to actually get out of your vehicles at Amboseli and post in front of these elephants? And it, that's a disaster waiting to happen. So I think it's also important that we think about what type of message we're sending when we put a picture out there. Um, this is Robert Irvin's image, which won the People's Choice Awards in the last year's Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. This is uh, a drone shot of a bushfire in Australia. And this created a lot of questions and a lot of controversy when it was revealed that this was the winning shot. And uh, so much so that Robert Irwin actually had to put out a press release explaining the story behind this shot. And the reason for that is that uh, drone photography over bushfires is illegal in Australia, um, mainly because you are compromising the efforts uh, and the fire services, is the search and rescue efforts, as well as um, um, you know the, the fire uh, fire services from doing their job in stopping the spread of bushfires. Um, so, but he put out the story behind the shot, and that it was that the fact that there was a slight caveat in the law that uh, if the bushfire is on private property um, and you haven't called in the fire services, you can in fact fly a drone over that. So. Uh, you can see that today when they, when you put an image out there, people will question it. Um, so, and um, unfortunately or fortunately, um, if you have used some unethical means to achieve that picture, more often than not, it will come to light because people, um, because with all of their global reach comes um, a lot of people scrutinizing your images. Now that's the downside of it, but I, um, over the, so when I started photography um, 10 years ago, it was all about, um, you know, taking pretty pictures. Um, I did never really thought about how many images could, you know, affect conservation. But in the last few years after moving to Australia, um, I think I've actually come to realize that through my images, I can actually do good. I can, uh, in my small way, help in the conservation efforts. This is um, one of my favorite images. So when Sydney went into a lockdown, um, well, we've been stuck in Australia for two years now. And uh, whale watching was one of the very few wildlife activities we could engage in. And um, so um, the, the hump, there's a humpback migration that happens um, across the coast uh, during May and November. So this image was taken last year. And I think the story of the humpback whale is one of success. Um, they were hunted to the brink of extinction in the 1960s, but once Australia banned hunting, their populations have recovered. Um, but I think images like this inspire so much of them, nothing um, as amazing as watching a 40 ton animal launch itself out of the water. And I think it inspires all of, and it inspires you to conserve these gorgeous animals. And I like to use images like this to actually convey that we might have won the battle, but we haven't won the war. Um, humpback whales still face many threats. Um, apart from climate change, you know, they get caught in fishing nets, there's vessel strikes, plastic pollution. And unfortunately, one of the threats that have come up in the last few years is krill farming. I don't know about Sri Lanka, but Australians have a craze for krill um, supplements. And what basically what we're doing is we're taking the humpback whales um, food um, out of the ocean to create supplements for humans. Um, so that's obviously going to have a big impact um, on humpback whales in the future. Um, so I think we can use our images to get these messages across to inspire awe and to 
um, make people understand why it is so important to preserve these animals for the next generations to share as well. Um, this is another image from Australia. Um, and this, these are Brumbies, actually these are wild horses, descendants of the horses that were brought to Australia by the European settlers. Um, Australians have a love-hate relationship with Brumbies. On the one hand, um, some people consider them to be an Australian icon. On the other hand, they are considered to be pests because they do have a detrimental effect on native wildlife and wilderness areas. And uh, many believe that Taking pretty pictures of them actually heightens their image as an Australian icon. Um, and I have got accused of, you know, being a part of the problem when I take pictures like this. But to me, that's not what this picture is. It starts a conversation. It's a controversial topic and it, it starts a very vital con con a conversation about the good and the bad of, you know, um, of, and what measures can be taken to solve this problem. So, and I think to me, these images, these beautiful images also serve as a timely reminder that those who ultimately suffer from the idiocy of us humans and the, hu the decisions that we humans make are actually these animals because there've been very, a lot of proposals to cull these horses. And that is most probably needed if we are to save the native wildlife and the wilderness areas. But because of bad decisions made by humans, these animals are the ones who ultimately suffer. And hopefully images like this will be a reminder that we need to think twice before introducing growth and invasive species um, to countries. Um, so you, you've seen the good and the bad. Um, so that's what I was trying to show you, that uh, you can use images for conservation, um, uh, but unfortunately, if you go about it the wrong way, um, there is a high probability that that will be exposed. Um, now, what can we do? Um, I don't claim to be an expert. I don't have a degree in conservation, um, but I can share with you my, um, uh, my mantras, my ethos when I'm out there doing wildlife photography. And I think the first thing for me is that I try not to do any harm. Um, if I can't take an image without changing the behavior on, of an animal, or if I can't, um, uh, or if I'm doing something that is causing the animal distress, uh, I will walk away. Um, I think something I always try to remember is that the animal is way more important than the shot that I'm trying to take. Um, and I think the, uh, I don't believe that you need to uh, engage in unethical or responsible behavior get a great image. If you do your research and you understand animal behavior, um, you really can get great shots. And another thing that I live by um, is, um, is if I can actually, if I can't actually share what happened behind the scenes when taking a particular shot, um, then I think I've not gone about it the right way. So if you can't be transparent about how you've taken a shot, it, at least for me, I tend to pull away because um, if I'm ashamed to share what I've done to get that shot, then there's something wrong with that image. Um, keeping it wild, basically, um, this I think is a personal choice. Um, what you do with, uh, what are your thoughts on baiting, feeding wild animals using recorded calls for bird photography? Um, I think those are personal choices and you need to make a decision as to where you stand on them. For me, I um, do not photograph any animals um, that are baited or fed. Um, that's the personal preference. Um, in some countries, live baiting is um, illegal. So, they, and uh, even if it's a dead baiting, I, I don't engage um, in that kind of photography. Um, I have been absolutely desperate to photograph more leopards in the wild. Unfortunately, at present, there are no tools available that don't bait. Um, so that might unfortunately be a dream that'll die with me, but so be it. Um, and I think the next one's really silly. It's about following rules and regulations. They're there for a reason. We might think that uh, it's a really silly rule that you can't off-road in the Matai Mara. Uh, but if you think about the thousands of vehicles that visit the national park, 
on a yearly basis. Can you imagine the habitat loss if all of these vehicles start to go wherever they want to? Uh, and other things like crowding the animals, drone usage. Um, in most countries, you can't use drones over national parks. And I think it's really important to respect those rules. And um, as I said before, by understanding animal behavior, and if you pick the right guides, you really can get pretty amazing shots without uh, resorting to um, um, what may be considered irresponsible. Um, so I'll just share a few measures that I came across that I come across uh, while thinking about what I wanted to speak today. Um, I read this article that really shocked me about um, uh, bird photographers. Um, this particular article was about China, but it's about practices that seem to be common among bird photographers, unfortunately, not just in China, but around the world. And in fact, we see this a lot in Australia as well. Um, this particular shot, um, apparently the photographer actually took scissors and pruned the nest uh, before shooting. Um, and if you just stop and think about it, it's pretty horrifying what those poor nestlings would have gone through. Um, so many instances in Australia where people hatch off the branches. Um, and what you do is you expose the nestlings um, to, the, to weather and most of the time they don't survive. Um, is it really worth it? We've, we've all got big lenses and really having a branch in your way isn't too bad a thing. You're showing what it, what it naturally looks like. Um, this image uh, is about photographing nocturnal animals. This was taken by my friend Doug Gibbsy in Melbourne. Um, and that's a little penguin, the nocturnal. They get blinded by flashes. And unfortunately, uh, there have been so many instances um, of flash photography being used that practically everywhere where little, little penguins come to land, uh, photography as a whole has been banned. Um, but that is not to say that you can't responsibly take photographs of nocturnal animals. Um, this is a shot that I took of a leopard in Manapuz in Zimbabwe. Um, if you go with people who know what they're doing, um, you can see that the leopard is not um, bothered by the light at all. Uh, if he was, some, his eyes would be really big, um, but you don't, you never direct it at his eyes, you direct it away and you can still get some pretty, uh, pretty nice shots. Macro photography, I think is another area in which we hear a lot of, uh, you know, irresponsible behavior. Um, this is a very sad, uh, it's a skink tied up um, to a pole you hear of, um, uh, insects being killed, um, insects being frozen, uh, pinned with needles and all sorts of things um, being done for macro photography. Um, if you think you can't take a picture um, without resorting to this kind of, uh, a very a good macro uh, photography picture without resorting to this kind of uh, behavior, um, one of the photographers that I, I know personally and I follow a lot is Pratik Pradhan. He's macro shots are just amazing. They actually encouraged me to try macro. I'm really bad at it, but, um, and he um, doesn't even use flash. He uses natural light and um, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, hunt, hunts is another instance when, um, unfortunately to get that perfect shot, um, sometimes um, photographers resort to actually interrupting the hunt. Um, in Africa, there's an unwritten rule that you don't move your vehicle while um, the cheetahs or the lions are actually stalking. But what happens is that people start moving around and you actually interrupt the hunt. Um, and I actually, in my repertoire of images, I have seen lots and lots of cheetah hunts, but I don't have a cheetah hunting image that I'm actually proud of. Um, but these lions hunting was a very special sighting. And um, uh, we were just sitting uh, around, there was nobody around because everybody had given up and gone off and then this happened. Um, and for those that follow um, the Mara, that's Log Papitan Obanati hunting a warthog. Um, so you can get some pretty special images without interrupting a hunt. We were just by the side of the road watching this unfold. Now this image is one that I um, actually have never shared on social media. And it can show that even photographers with good intentions can sometimes be driven astray. Um, 
in India, you know, they use elephants um, to, um, you know, to track tigers. And this particular type, and, and what I don't like about that, uh, apart from the animal cruelty aspects of riding elephants, which I won't get into, but um, is that tigers are, uh, the elephants are used to provoke tigers. And that is exactly what happened. It's a cool shot. It's one I will never use um, when I feel ashamed um, happened. And this is what I said, if you can't be frank about what took place behind the scenes, then I don't think that image um, was a good one. Um, so you'll never see me share this on social media, but I thought it was a good instance. Sometimes we do things not because we want to actually uh, be responsible and ethical, but it's because we don't have all the facts or we just um, you know, aren't aware and don't have the right, right knowledge. Um, so baiting is a controversial topic. Um, as I said, I personally don't like it. Um, live baiting especially is a big no-no for me. Uh, dead baits, it's up to you to make up your mind as to you know, whether you're okay with that or not. For me, if it changes the behavior, the natural behavior of an animal, then it's a no for me. And I guess we also, if you're also feeding animals, you need to think about things like, is the food appropriate? Many times, unfortunately, birds are fed uh, food that is um, inappropriate and that can actually harm them. And do remember that in some countries, um, it is just plain illegal to feed animals. Um, baiting is a very controversial, um, controversial topic, which is why um, some photography awards won't let you enter baited images and others actually insist that you actually disclose the fact that baiting was involved. Um, I think um, the, yeah, I, I found um, this very interesting comment on the Yellowstone National Park website, which basically stated a fed animal is a dead animal. And I think Yellowstone has been having this issue where animals just get so used to being fed that they become comfortable around humans. And unfortunately, when you're dealing with predators, um, that's a very dangerous situation to be in. And so many bears are put down every single year in Yellowstone because um, people feed them and they become too comfortable. And the same for foxes. Um, now, this is an example, um, and it's a shot taken by Isaac Pretorius, uh, another wildlife photographer of the year. Um, um, of all. Um, so basically what I was saying is that um, this particular shot is of an African fish eagle. Um, they often get baited for photos by throwing in dead fish. Um, and unfortunately, dead fish sink. So stuffing a piece, so what they do is they stuff a piece of papyrus into the fish's mouth to help them float. But um, stuffed fish actually float upside down, not sideways. So if you do see a fish eagle with an upside down fish, that basically means that it's a setup shot. So there are ways in which um, you can kind of identify baited images. So if you are submitting a baited image for, an, for a competition, it's always best um, to um, state um, that it was a setup or a baited shot. Um, same for these owls. Um, uh, they, he has a white mouse in his um, mouth. Um, white mice don't actually exist in the owl's habitat, uh, in its natural habitat. So it is um, actually from a pet shop. Um, there is a danger. So I was talking about overcrowding, unfortunately an issue that uh, we face all over the world. And um, I think it's, um, what, I, what we try to do is to just be responsible, um, really. There's, uh, I think as wildlife photographers, there's really not much fun taking this kind of picture where there's one cheetah and lots of vehicles. So I personally tend to pull away when these um, kind of situations happen. And um, I think you can kind of go out on your own and you can find a very unique situation um, which you're not sharing with anyone. Um, that you can uh, photograph and share with the world. Um, this is another shot of the Yellowstone. Um, you can see a lot of people taking the same shot. Um, there's really nothing unique um, if so many people are taking that same shot. Um, so drone photography is another controversial. I will admit that I have a very cheap drone and I just love it. Um, but I've only ever used it for landscapes, mainly because Australia doesn't let you 
um, fly drones in national parks. That's the case in a lot of other countries. Uh, images like this worry me and it makes me wonder um, the impact um, of it. both animals obviously know that the drone is above them. Um, Hobbies drones are very, very loud. Um, and it makes me wonder um, how much are we altering their behavior and how much of disturbance are we causing if we are flying drones over animals. So again, doesn't mean that you can't. Um, in Australia, I know quite a few people who do drone photography of humpback whales, beautiful footage. Um, but there are laws as to how, how high you need to be. Um, so it can be done um, ethically and responsibly. Talk about understanding animal behavior and um, also um, I think having the right guides. This was a very special trip that we did to Manapools in Zimbabwe. Um, and our guide was Nick Murray. If you have watched David Attenborough's Dynasties, the Wild Dog edition, uh, the segment was actually guided um, by Nick Murray and his wife, Des. Um, we were extremely lucky to be guided by him in Manapools. And Manapools is a very special location because you can actually track animals on foot. You can get very close to wild dogs, um, to elephants. You can see how close we are. Um, and you can uh, even track lions on foot very, very, um, safely and responsibly. So having the right guides mean that you can get up close and personal and get some really unique shots and you're not breaking any laws uh, and you're not putting the animals in danger. Um, along with that comes um, the importance of understanding animal behavior. If you do a little bit of research, um, if you're new to a location, I love to research the animals that I might photograph and try and understand, watch some videos and try and understand um, the kind of behavior that I'd like. Um, I, I always have a list in my head of the kind of behavior that I'd like to photograph. Most of them remain unticked, but you do get bizarre situations instead. So when I realized it was raining a lot in the Mara, one of the shots that I really did want was a lion shaking his mane with all the water droplets flying. Never got that, but I did get cheetahs, um, you know, um, swimming across the flooded river. So if you have an open mind, and instead of, you know, kind of chasing the one shot that you really, really want to get, um, and uh, you, can, you can be privy to some pretty amazing behavior. And I think um, that's something I have learned over the years. Um, so when I started wildlife photography, it was all about photographing leopards at the Isle. Um, I've stood in the queues of 20 vehicles, sometimes waiting to photograph um, the tail of a leopard. Um, but um, over the years, I've learned that sometimes um, um, in some pretty amazing encounters um, like these. Um, this was a tough day in Ambassadeur. Um, this is in famous Boswell in Manapools. This, this shot was actually taken on foot. Um, this is Tim. Um, so interesting story here. Tim just before, this was Tim six days before he passed away. And you can, as he was in a conservancy, we could have got down and taken this shot, um, you know, lying down on the ground, but instead we opted to use a monopod and turn the camera upside down because it's if he whether whether what we whether what whether approaching them on foot was actually legal or not. Um, all of these shots uh, come about due to knowing animal behavior and being able to actually anticipate what they do next. Um, so you can create some pretty unique and special images. Uh, photographing humpback whales, I think, um, is most probably uh, the the toughest thing I have ever done. Uh, you have absolutely no idea. They come off, they breach off a very deep dive. You have absolutely no idea where they're going to come up from. Um, and you can't really hold the camera up, um, you know, for the 10 minutes that they are. Um, but by understanding um, uh, the way they dive, by understanding, so if you, if you know that their downtime is five to eight minutes, you can actually relax your hands for five minutes. You don't have to hold it up. Uh, by watching their tail or fluke when they dive, if they, they do a very straight up fluke when, they, uh, when they're doing a sounding dive, and usually breaches occur of sounding dives. Um, so uh, just by knowing animal behavior, you can set yourself up for success, uh, better than just going out there and um, 
you know, getting up close and personal and trying for uh, trying to do things a bit irresponsibly. This is one of uh, my favorite bridge shots. I've never seen another bridge like that. It's a bizarre bridge and um, uh, I just love these images. Um, okay, so that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening to me prattling on and I'm very, very sorry about the, um, the connectivity issues. Um, yeah, never expected that to happen, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Delany. Uh, and thanks to all those participants who stayed on in spite of the breakdowns. I think that shows how interesting and insightful the presentation was. Uh, quite a few interesting areas to explore here, Delany. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, there are quite a few, uh, I would say, youngsters who are now getting into wildlife photography. Uh, who are focused on singular subject, uh, who just drive up and down looking for that specific uh, uh, subject and then miss out a lot of those other things that the parks have to offer. What would be your advice to them in terms of building a, a profile of images, building more than just that leopard shot at Yala or Vilpatu or... Uh, yeah, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, yep. So Spencer, I was one of those when I started um, photography ten years back. I was one of those. Uh, you know, it was all about getting those perfect leopard shots um, at Yala. And as I said, I've stood in queues of 20, 30 vehicles, people shouting at each other, and um, and actually, all you can see is usually a tail of a leopard. Um, you know, over the years, I've learned to slow down. There is so much more that our national parks can offer um, rather than leopards. Um, having grown up, big cats remain some of my favorites to photograph around the world. Uh, but um, there are so many, um, even the common animals, you can, you, you can catch them in um, such unique behavior that, um, it doesn't have to be a big cat. It doesn't have to be a sloth bear um, in Africa. It doesn't have to be one of the big five. Um, if you look at um, um, some, some of the wildlife photographer of the uh, awards, um, the images, um, there are some very common animals engaging in very interesting uh, behavior. And I think what makes the image unique um, and I think that really shows your skill if you can, you know, catch a gray langer doing something uh, or a bee that doing something unique and different rather than a lovely portrait of a leopard that they, um, so I'm sure my dad, one of the things he's gonna tell me after he's seen this is that you don't have any bird images in there and he's right. Um, I don't do uh, as much bird photography as I'd like, but I have taken an interest in doing more of that because I think it's important to have around in portfolio. Right. Uh, one of the positive signs of the uh, the youngsters getting into uh, photography and wildlife uh, areas is that uh, somehow they are a lot more conscious about uh, the impact they have uh, than some of the seniors who have probably caused fair amount of damage. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anything you have? Any word of advice to the people who are starting up into wildlife, wildlife photography. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, you can hear me. Sorry, connection became unstable. I don't know what's going on with Australia today, but <laughs> um, so I think, um, as you said, I think unlike us 20 years back, um, today there is a greater focus on being more ethical, being more responsible. There were lectures like this, there were lots of um, articles written, um, and I think um, a lot of the shows talk about it. And I think it's amazing that the youngsters are just, uh, I think, our, frankly, I think our generation has let um, the planet down. Um, we have left this planet in quite a mess uh, for the youngsters to pick up the pieces and put it all back together again. Um, and I think they understand that. And um, I think if you if you can actually um, create awareness, if you 
think about the conservation, um, the message, the conservation message that you can show through your images, I think you will, you really will make a really good photographer um, in this current environment, because that's what most of the um, photography awards um, are looking for. Uh, for of the year, this year's theme was a planet in at uh, risk. And so there's a lot of focus on conservation, on how to combat climate change. Um, and I think as youngsters, you, you understand better than we did 20 years ago, um, the impact that our um, activities have on this planet. Right. Uh, would sort of controlling now, for example, uh, bird nest photography is not uh, accepted in any wildlife photography competitions. Would bringing in more restrictions like that, uh, for example, if you have to even rule out, okay, no leopard shots in a specific competition, would that kind of help? Would you, what would you? Uh... That's, a tough, that's a tough one. I actually understand yeah. why nest photography, especially chase snowy owls until they drop dead. To, um, I think you can, you can stop you from sharing, you can stop people from entering them into competitions. And I guess you could still share them on your personal pages. And I think what it also does is that it maybe to some extent, if you can't share snowy owl pictures, the beautiful creatures, you can't really build awareness and encourage others um, who would never see a snowy owl in the wild to actually conserve them if you can't see them or photograph them. So I think that those kind of restrictions work to a certain extent, but I think they can also hinder conservation efforts. Okay, you, you did confess something that uh, uh, when you did start photography, you also went behind the charismatic species like the leopards and stuff like that. What are the turning point and what triggered you to uh, shift from that to uh, authority in the absence of another word to be a little more responsible and more conscious? Um, I think it was a gradual shift. Um, it was um, it was following some of the um, some of the photographers that I greatly admire, looking at their images, looking at um, along with you know people of my generation becoming more responsible. I think even the even awards like the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, they just started that I realized that I wasn't getting anything very unique. Um, it's really lovely to put up a you know, gorgeous portrait of a leopard, but you've got, if you've got 10 other people taking the exact same shot from the exact same place, you don't really have anything unique. Um, and at the same time, I think I also realized, especially going to Africa, where everything was, is new to us, you know, the first couple of trips, and it was never about the big cats then. Um, in first trip, because everything is new, and then you kind of understand that even the most common animals, like an impala or a, um, you know, any antelope, is it can really give you really special shots. Um, so being out there, seeing uh, different animals in their different habitats, but also realizing that I wanted um, to do more with my photography than just putting up beautiful portraits of leopards um, and that I can actually use it as a tool for something um, more and to and, and it's also I think when people see it and they tell me oh my god you know this was an amazing image and I wanted to like um, and I've con you know contributed or yeah. given to charity or a charitable organization because I saw your image and I really couldn't believe the story behind it it really kind of makes you feel that you're doing something right um, so that wasn't a, you know, specific turning point, but it was a gradual world as a whole has also shifted um, the, the way of thinking of, you know, um, wildlife photographers as a whole. What percentage of your photographs are sort of pre-planned with uh, in-depth knowledge of the behavior of this animal that you're going to photograph? What kind of preparation would you generally do before you set out on a uh, say uh, a wildlife trip or anything like that. What kind of research, background research uh, do you generally carry out? Today? Sure. So I've gone to Africa very many times. Um, so, you know, these days, Africa, the African animals, I kind of know quite well, but 
Um, for example, we are hoping to go to Brazil next year to photograph jaguars. Um, well, actually it was planned for 2020, but nothing really happened in 2020. So, um, so I think I want to find the right guide. For me, my guides are everything. Um, I will follow them to the ends of the earth. Um, so apart from being able to get, get me unique shots, what I also want in a guide is somebody who shares the same ethos as me. That's really important. Um, so when we were looking uh, for a guide to guide us in Brazil, um, in the Pantanal, uh, there were um, another, I spoke about African fish eagles being baited. Um, this is another common practice in Brazil where they throw fish in um, onto the river to photograph eagles swooping in. Um, so there were lots of people who recommended that we, um, you know, go and spend a couple of days at those lodges. And my answer was no, I'm not interested in that. Um, so the first thing I do in terms of research is finding a guide, especially when I'm going to a country that I've never been to before and I've never seen the animals. Um, having someone who shares my um, mantras and my ethos in wildlife photography, as well as know the behavior, um, but also know photography, so who can position me without me having to say, oh my God, move here, move there, um, you know, for the shot is, um, is really important. Um, and then I watch lots and lots and lots. There's just so much out there, you know, YouTube has, it's, it's like self excited for the trip because these trips are planned like a year in advance and then you kind of, you know, mellow down and then closer to that, it'll be like lots and lots and lots of videos. Um, so my shots, as I said, I would, I have a list of shots that I would like to get. Um, most of the time they don't happen, <laughs> but um, I try to make them happen. I talk to my guides and I say, oh, can we try for these? And, but if they don't, uh, usually because I've picked the right guides, they can get me um, really unique images. Um, so as I said, in the Mara, I wanted a lion shaking, found lots of lions, nobody wanted to shake a mane for me. But uh, my um, guide and, uh, guide and friend, Anthony Tira, he, um, when he saw the cheetahs approach the river, he said, we're going to spend the whole day there. So we waited eight hours to see that. Um, and can you believe that there wasn't a single photographer? It was just me and my husband photographed. So many photographers came, looked at the river, said they're not going to cross, they went away. So, um, uh, you know, it was pretty amazing. There wasn't a single other photographer when, that, when such a unique sighting happened. Right. And that, I, I suppose the patience helps and works. And I think all of us, some of us have benefited from it and some of us have walked away and it's the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another question from one of our own members is that when do you plan on coming to Sri Lanka and is, it, is there a possibility of you having an exhibition in Sri Lanka? I would love yeah. to. Um... Unfortunately, my day job just takes so much time and I know that there is a lot of work that goes into an exhibition. Um, I am, unfortunately, COVID ruined my plans in the last two years. So let me grow my portfolio more. As I said, Jaguars, um, I want to, um, well, we're already booked to go and do polar bears. So, you know, once I've um, got more uh, and different species of wildlife, I think I will definitely um, think of doing an exhibition. As to coming to Sri Lanka, that will definitely happen um, uh, next year, early next year. Um, I haven't been there now for more than two years. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely, I want to see my right. leopards. Uh, I call them my babies. <laughs> uh, just another, uh, an expert comment from Mr. Arjun, uh, Arjun Rajasurya from IUCN, who is a marine specialist, he has also just pointed out this for the benefit of those who are listening in, uh, that never to use flash photography even for turtle nest. Uh, I think flash photography and wildlife are probably uh, two things that go, don't go together, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there are a few more questions, but I think with this current uh, uh, net connection and stuff like that, I would like to just wrap it up. Uh, would you have any final word of advice to the the youngsters who have tuned in today? How uh, to grow their portfolio, what to focus on? Um, get out there and just keep doing it. You know, the more chance you have of seeing something unique. Um, don't forget the small animals. Even a little dumb beetle can give you some pretty amazing shots. Um, and, um, you know, 
try and use your images of conservation purposes. Um, remember that um, in this current environment, most of the awards are looking for a conservation story behind your pictures. Um, in most competitions, especially the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, um, a pretty picture just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, most probably why I've never submitted. This was the first year that I've ever submitted an image um, to the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. So, um, but each image has a story to tell and um, through that story, you really can do um, a lot in con conserving these animals that we love so much. Thank you so much, Dilni, for sharing a very, very late evening over there. Uh, oh. And I think, yeah, we did have some power interruptions. Uh, just for the benefit of the uh, members who are tuned in, we will edit this video and set it out there. Probably in about two days time, it will be available on the WMPS YouTube channel. Uh, once again, I'd like to extend our sincere appreciation to Dilini for his wonderful uh, experience uh, that you shared with us now. Uh, it's also great uh, from a very, very, very fresh perspective. Uh, and I think there were a lot of uh, new line of thinking that a lot of uh, uh, guests can walk away with today. That's something uh, a great knowledge that have been shared, Dilini. Thank you so much. And I'd like to once again thank our partner, Nation Trust Bank, for supporting the WMPS lecture series for the last five years and helping us uh, not just with that, with multiple conservation initiatives that we undertake with the trust and confidence that they be there to support us. Thank you so much, Dilini, uh, and a good night to you and a good night to all our listeners. Uh, members are tuned in today. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night.